In this video, we'll move from the concept render shown in the last video to a working prototype. In the last video, we went through the concept development phase. We looked at the math behind the Duple, picked a few components to work with, and created a rough concept of what the final items might look like. The goal of this video is to fully design and bring the idea to life for the first time. The first step in working with electronics is to create a block diagram to understand the programming flow and an electrical schematic to understand the electrical components. This is typically followed by a breadboard prototype to combine the two, allowing for a quick assessment of basic functionality before committing time to a more formalized design. The block diagram for this device is straightforward. The device checks whether the ball has been picked up. If the answer is yes, the motor will turn on and begin spinning at the desired speed. If the answer is no, nothing should happen. Expanding on this simple functional block diagram, we start thinking about the electrical components and how we'll use them to achieve the desired function. To detect if the ball has been picked up, we need something that detects the ball's presence. A simple limit switch would work, but I don't think it would be very good. I want something that feels a little more magical when the user is using it. I plan on using a light-dependent resistor. The ball will block light from hitting the sensor when it's in place, but the light can hit the sensor once the ball has been removed. I believe this will be easier to hide and will maintain an element of magic. Once the ball is detected, we need to turn the motor on. The specifics of motor selection vary on a project-by-project -project basis. For this project, I'm going to use a stepper motor. They're inexpensive and the easiest motor to program a constant speed with. To control the stepper motor, I'm going to need a stepper motor driver. These are readily purchasable and significantly simplify the programming. To interface with the light sensor and the stepper driver, I'm going to need a microcontroller. This is where the code goes and is constantly assessing what the appropriate next step is. And the only remaining item is power. The microcontroller and light sensor require 5 volt, while the stepper and stepper controller need 12 volts. To make it user friendly, I plan on using a USB C cable for power. Since it'll be plugged in and not battery powered, I'll have unlimited power for whichever voltage I choose. However, I do face an immediate challenge. I have two voltage requirements, 5 volts and 12 volts. Technically, USB-C could handle either, but only one at a time. This means I'll need to either step up the 5 volts to 12 or vice versa. Translating all of this into physical parts, I need a small through-hole light-dependent resistor, a thin NEMA 17 stepper motor, a TMC2208 stepper driver, an ATtiny85 microprocessor, a USB-C power sync device, and a voltage converter. Breadboard starts by connecting all of the components together. Power comes in from the USB-C and is routed to the 12 volt rail and the buck converter. The buck converter converts 12 volts down to five volts for the microprocessor. The processor is connected to the board and supplied with power. The stepper driver is connected to both power rails, the stepper, as well as the processor. And finally, the photoresistor is connected to the processor, which monitors its output. Making all of these connections on a breadboard gives us a first look at the functional circuit and the amount of space that is needed. To make this pile of electrics do anything though, the microcontroller needs some code to actually perform the tasks required. So onto the code, you know, the ones and zeros that do stuff. The goal of the code is to transform our block diagram into instructions a microprocessor can follow. We'll start by rewriting the steps sequentially and then slowly add detail in subsequent passes. First, we'll want to tell the processor what's plugged into it. So there's a light sensor and there's a stepper motor driver. Everything else is not directly connected to the processor, so it has no way of communicating with it. Next in the flowchart is the question, has the ball been picked up? We've decided to detect this using the light sensor. If the ball is blocking the light, it's in place. If it's missing, we can assume it's been picked up. So translating that into code, basically we look at the light sensor and if the light sensor is above a certain value, spin the motor. If it is below that value, stop the motor. This style of pseudocode is a helpful method of problem solving at a high level. If your code doesn't make sense in plain English, it's going to be difficult to translate that into working code. The next step is to take this plain English description and translate it into code. Programming and syntax are a bit beyond the scope of this video, but it's relatively easy to translate this into usable code. I'm going to use the common library XL stepper to assist in spinning the motor smoothly. I'll initialize a few variables to hold the LDR values, as well as calculate the velocity ramp of the stepper. Because of how the Excel stepper library works, I need to slowly increase the speed until it's at the desired max speed. I do this with a combination of while and if statements. That's pretty much all of our code. Uploading this to the breadboard prototype, we can see the code reacts as expected. At this point, we're ready to start designing a circuit board, but since the circuit needs to fit into the overall assembly, we're going to jump into the CAD model first to see how much room we have for the eventual PCB. 
It's notoriously difficult to walk through a CAD design process in a compelling way on video. I'm going to walk you through my initial thought process followed by the final CAD model. Just know the process of going from initial thought to ready to manufacture design is full of dead ends, false starts, and a lot of really rough sketches. So the first step in creating something in CAD is to establish scale. This can be determined by the manufacturing capabilities, user interface, existing components, or just made up on the spot. For this project, I want to be able to manufacture the curved surface on my pocket NC. That makes four inch diameter the largest I can go. This lines up pretty well with the scale I had in my head, so I'm just gonna start with that. Looking at the breadboard, I'm confident all the selected components will fit in the preliminary design at the scale I've chosen. Since all of the electrical parts can and should be stationary in this design, I can put them in the base and have the saddle be its own rotating thing. I modeled the saddle curve into a cylinder, then had to do some CAD shenanigans to get the brass inserts to show up properly, but the overall form is pretty simple. I essentially just wanted the rotating assembly to have a ball next to it, and I just <laughs> connected that with a nice uh, round over piece here. But go into the model now. I'm actually going to slice it. It's easier to see the components. So. Up top is all wood and brass. This will be custom CNC machined, and that'll be kind of for the next video, the details on how I'm going to make that. But uh, moving downward, we've got the first 3D printed part. So this part here is a saddle adapter, and this is what I'm going to use, just 3D printed. It's what I'm going to use to connect the saddle to the NEMA 17. I have the majority of the functional parts made out of 3D prints. This allows me to have the precision and tweakability of a 3D printed part with the aesthetic of the wood and walnut I ultimately want. Whenever I can, I try to separate things that are likely to change from things that take a long time to make. I would hate to have created a beautiful curved surface only to have to remake it from scratch to tweak how the bearing fits together. Flexibility and taking advantage of the strengths of your manufacturing process are hallmarks of a well thought out design. The saddle curve interface, as well as the inner housing, which holds the circuit board, stepper, motor, bearing, and screws, everything together, is 3D printed for this reason. If I need to tweak something in the future, it's an easy 3D print instead of redoing all the hard work with wood and more exotic materials. The circuit board is just a stand-in at the moment. The outline is made up. I'll do my best to fit all the parts I need onto the board. If I'm wrong, I'll have to come back to the CAD and update it to give myself more room. The stepper motor will be directly screwed to the circuit board, which simplifies the assembly. The outermost surface is a piece of matching walnut to hide all the functional components. And at the bottom, I add some feet and a base plate to make it look just a little bit nicer. We can quickly jump into KiCad to show the preliminary electrical schematics and circuit design. The process is essentially to take the breadboard and transfer it into the computer. I've got my USB-C connector, stepper driver, LDR and microprocessor, a step-down voltage regulator, and a few filtering capacitors and a LED just to show that it has power. I find it helpful to remember that a circuit board is mostly just fancy wires. It's a nicer and easier way to work than a hand-wired prototype. This project is open source, so I'll leave a link to the source files in the description for those that are interested in literally how I put the model together. If you're interested in more of a how-to video, leave me a comment. If enough people are interested, I can make that a tangential series. Finally, putting it all together. I believe the design is ready to manufacture, but there's a great opportunity to test the design as is to ensure there are no tweaks I wanna make before committing significant time and effort to the final build. 3D printing is fantastic for this. More than half of the parts are already 3D printed, but there's no reason I can't 3D print all of them to test that they fit together and that they function as intended. 3D printers are priceless for just this alone. The alternative is to make the whole thing with real and expensive parts and just kind of hope it works. Putting this prototype together is not meant to look good, but purely test if everything works as intended. The electronic guts are hanging out the side, none of the materials are correct, and it doesn't look very good. The important part is that it works as expected though. If anything is wrong at this stage, it's better to catch it here and fix it before the expensive materials are pulled out. But that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll take everything we learned from this beta prototype and create the finished design. This project is completely open source. All of the files can be found in the description. Make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on projects like this. See you next time.
Bye.